Good morning, everybody. Um, very nice to, uh, to have you with us this morning. Um, my name is Aidan Little. I'm the uh, UK's permanent representative to the Conference on Disarmament here in Geneva. Um, and I'm very, uh, very pleased to, uh, to welcome everybody this morning to this, uh, this uh, side event of the Cluster Munitions Convention Review Conference uh, on risk education, uh, why risk education on cluster munitions matters. Uh, and we're going to be taking a deep dive uh, on risk education in the draft Lausanne Action Plan. Um, this side event is, uh, is brought to you by uh, the Explosive Ordnance Risk Education Advisory Group. Um, the, uh, uh, the advisory group is a, a coalition of over a dozen UN agencies, international organizations and international NGOs that provides overall guidance to the sector uh, and identifies ways to improve the integration effectiveness efficiency and relevance of uh, explosive ordnance risk education or EOR um, as I enjoy calling it. Um, just a couple of house uh, housekeeping uh, points before we get started. Um, as you can see on the screen uh, this event is being uh, recorded um, so it will be available to uh, uh, anybody who uh, didn't fancy getting up quite this early in the morning um, particularly in time zones to the east of us. Um, uh, please do uh, keep your microphone muted at all times, uh, unless you're called on to speak. Um, uh, we, can, uh, we can also um, mute uh, mics um, manually as well, so, um, so we'll, we'll, we'll do that if, if there's any sort of interruptions or disturbances. Um, we'll have uh, an opportunity obviously for a discussion um, after the, uh, the presentations. Um, if you'd like to, uh, to ask a question or to make a comment, you can raise your virtual hand, as I'm sure we're all used to uh, by now. Um, that's on the, uh, in the reactions box at the bottom of your screen. Um, if you don't want to do that, then uh, you can also put your question in the, uh, in the chat box, um, where it will be, be visible and we'll monitor that and, uh, and bring up questions as they, as they appear in the chat box as well. Um, please do try and keep your questions uh, reasonably to the point. Um, uh, one of the joys of virtual side events, obviously, is that people can join us from uh, from anywhere. But uh, for those of us who actually uh, have to be in the room at the Palais uh, for the start of the review conference, um, like me, I, I will have to wrap this up just before 10 to allow myself to get down to the uh, to the Palais. Um, if we if we don't have time to get through all the questions, we will uh, we will follow up afterwards um, so that uh, so that all points are are, are covered. Um, let me just uh, say a couple of words on on why this uh, why this uh, why this subject matters. Obviously, uh, as we all know, the uh, humanitarian consequences of cluster munitions are severe and long lasting. Um, civilians account for uh, almost all. In fact, I think in the cluster in the most recent um, edition of the cluster munitions monitor um, in, in the last available years, uh, civilians accounted for all of the uh, casualties um, recorded from cluster munitions. Um, and the, the, the critical risk of uh, the critical role of risk education in protecting civilians from uh, the risk of uh, cluster munitions has been uh, recognized, I think, for a long time, but, but has particular prominence now in the draft Lausanne Action Plan, which I hope we'll be adopting uh, later today. Um, the draft of that action plan states that the delivery of effective and relevant risk education interventions remain one of the primary means of preventing new accidents, thereby mitigating the risks that cluster munitions pose to lives and livelihoods in affected communities. Um, it also em emphasizes that th these interventions should, quote, respond to the different vulnerabilities, roles, and needs of women, girls, boys, and men from all groups and focus on achieving behavioral change, end quote. Um, one of the particularly pernicious effects of cluster munitions, obviously, is that they remain a risk long after conflict has ended. Uh, and we've seen we've seen examples of this from all over the world um, for many, many years now. Um, and that's why not only clearing cluster munitions and, uh, and destroying their stockpiles is important, but also uh, risk education um, play, play, plays a, a, a vital role. Um, Many of you will know from following uh, events in the Ottawa Convention on, uh, on anti-personnel landmines that the UK has uh, recently completed clearance in the Falkland Islands. Uh, and there is a, I've, I've seen myself from talking to, to Falkland Islanders, the importance of risk education. Um, obviously, you know, we, we, we've now com completed the, the, the clearance of the, of, of the remaining beaches there of, of, of landmines. But, but even after we completed uh, um, clearance there, a, a, a landmine washed up onto the, onto the beach um, a, a, a 
few months ago and had to be had to be made safe. So even after com uh, completion, uh, even after clearance has been completed, uh, you can see how uh, remaining contamination can still uh, can still uh, arise. And so decades after, certainly after conflict, but even after completion. Uh, it's vital that we that we continue to engage in risk education because the people who live there um, are living with the scourge of, of landmines and cluster munitions uh, for, for for a long time, uh, and uh, and they need to be made aware of how to how to deal with 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 that contamination and how to behave around um, explosive remnants of war, uh, even after even even a long time after conflict has ended. So with the tragic events that we've seen uh, in Nagorno Karabakh in Syria, um, in Yemen, in Libya. Uh, where we see uh, these awful weapons still being used, um, it's 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 absolutely vital that, that that as soon as possible we get involved in those communities and start risk education right from the very beginning, even before clearance can can start, uh, and as I say, long after it it ends. So it really is vital to um, uh, to our um, the aims and, aims and objectives of our of our convention. So it's 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 really good that this is recognised so clearly uh, in the Lausanne Action Plan. Uh, there are four concrete actions related to this uh, to this obligation, um, and I think the aim of our side event today is to try and bring these commitments to uh, to, to life. Um, there are four actions uh, that we're uh, that we're particularly uh, interested in, uh, and in a neat uh, numerical coincidence, we have four panelists um, uh, who will uh, who will be sharing their um, sharing their experiences and some real life examples that can illustrate. Um, why these actions are important and what we can do practically to uphold them. Um, after the uh, after the four presentations, as I said earlier, we'll we'll open the floor and have a chance for a bit of a discussion, which I hope will uh, bring a range of different perspectives and experiences to the to the table. Um, so I'll briefly introduce our four speakers now, and then and then hand over to them uh, to to speak um, to speak in turn. Um, first, we're going to hear from uh, from Ruth Bottomley, um, who uh, leads on research uh, at the um, uh, in, uh, in the impact team of the uh, of the ICBL uh, CMC, uh, working for the uh, for landmine and cluster munition monitor. Um, she's going to uh, outline some of the, the the findings from the latest cluster munition monitor report on uh, on on this. Uh, then we're going to hear from Yuba um, Gerasimova, um, who is a program management specialist at Unmass in Afghanistan. Uh, and she's going to give us some uh, some real life examples of behaviour change uh, in, uh, in 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 the work that Unmass and others have been doing in in Afghanistan. Uh, after that, we'll hear from uh, Mohammed Yassim, who is a risk education supervisor of the Al Had League in Iraq, um, who's going to talk about the uh, the, the safe space initiative. Uh, and then finally, we'll hear from uh, Celine Cheng, who is a, um, a specialist in uh, explosive ordnance risk education. Uh, with humanity and inclusion, and uh, it's a co-chair of the um, of, of the advisory group. Um, so, uh, without further ado, I will hand over to uh, to Ruth to get our um, our presentation started. Thank you, uh, Ambassador Liddell, and uh, thank you also to the um, EORE advisory group for asking me to be part of this important session. It's a great pleasure to be here. And good morning, everybody. So I've been asked to provide some insights into actions 28 and 29 of the Lausanne Action Plan, which I'm going to do drawing on some of the research from the Cluster Munition Monitor. So if I can have the next slide, please. So let's just take a quick look at action 28 and 29 and what they say. Action 28 asks that risk education activities and interventions are context specific, tailor made, prioritize at risk populations and are sensitive to gender, age, disability and the diversity of affected populations. Action 29 asks that uh, data is collected and it's gender, age and disability disaggregated. And that enables um, the identification and targeting of risk ed education interventions again towards the most vulnerable groups. And it also asks that we provide detailed reporting on risk education. Next slide, please. So if you have followed some of the sessions in the view review conference, you will have already heard some of these stats from our cluster munition report, but I think it's worth repeating them again, because obviously this is one of the main reasons that we have this convention. 
So in 2020, there were a total of 360 casualties, of which 60% were caused by cluster munition remnants and 40% by cluster munition attacks. Cluster munition remnants continue to have a disproportionate impact on civilians, and civilians accounted for all casualties where their status was recorded in 2020. They also significantly impact children who make up nearly half of the casualties at 44%. And when we look at casualties just from cluster munition remnants, children accounted for 47% of all casualties. The average age of children in 2020 was 11 years old. Cluster munitions also significantly impact men and boys who represent just over three quarters or 76% of all casualties where the age, where the sex was recorded. Next slide, please. So Action 29 um, refers to data collection and analysis. Um, so currently, Three, past, three state parties to the convention, Afghanistan, Lao PDR and Lebanon, are reported to have good national level casualty data available to help the prioritization of risk education. So I just wanted to take some time to look at why this is important. Good casualty data can provide information as to who is injured and killed, where the accident happened, what device caused the accident, and the activity at the time of the accident. The more details that can be provided on each individual incident, the better the picture that can be established as to who is at risk and why. Annual or regularly updated reporting helps to provide trends, which may also highlight irregularities and new developments which put people at risk. So just to give a few examples of that, we may find that in some countries, changes in agricultural techniques may put people more at risk from cluster munitions or population expansion into contaminated areas that were previously undeveloped or increases of casualties may occur due to um, a rise in the, in the price of scrap metal, which encourages scrap metal collection. In addition to having um, good casualty data, the conduct of CAP surveys to understand knowledge, attitudes, practices and behaviours and the impact of contamination on affected populations can complement and provide more contextual data which can support casualty data. So for example, it can help us to understand whether intentional risk taking, so that is people who actually intentionally pick up or go into contaminated areas, whether that is a result of economic necessity or other factors. It can also let us know whether there are gaps in knowledge or misinformation. And such studies may also be useful in areas where there is known contamination, but low numbers of casualties. Next slide, please. So action 28, context specific, tailor-made, and prioritizing populations most at risk and being sensitive to gender, age, disability and other factors. So already in state parties, there are some good examples of where risk education is being tailored to meet the diverse needs of specific high groups, which is required by this action. On the slide are some examples from states um, from states parties reporting in 2019 and 2020 of ta targeting specific groups impacted by cluster munitions. And then looking deeper at aspects of age, gender, disability and diversity of populations allows for the risk education to be well targeted to these specific groups. So again, I'm just gonna give some examples and to, to bring this to life. So in Lao PDR, analyzing activity at the time of accident was important to identify behaviors such as bystanding. So bystanders were often younger children, both male and female, watching older children, predominantly male, pick up cluster munition remnants, which resulted in multiple casualties. Understanding this risk behavior meant that it could be addressed through risk education, specifically to younger children, for example, through the primary school curriculum. 
In Lebanon, casualty data re revealed that Syrian refugees, both adults and adolescents, were being injured and killed by cluster munitions while undertaking agricultural laboring work, which led to the development of risk education campaigns targeting these workers. And in southern Iraq, following a rise of accidents, an intensive risk education campaign was organized at specific times of the year to reach Bedouin people who were crossing contaminated areas with their animal herds. Understanding clearly who the target groups are in terms of ethnicity, culture, language, and whether they include persons with disabilities is important to ensure that not only are the messages correct, but the delivery methods are also appropriate and can be understood. Next slide, please. So back again to Action 2019, state party reporting. The Action 29 requires detailed reporting on risk education as part of um, annual transparency reporting. Currently, the reporting is a mixed picture, with some state parties providing detailed information on activities and approaches, but with no disaggregated beneficiary data, and other state parties providing only disaggregated beneficiary data, but with no updates on activities. No state party, as far as I am aware, has reported on persons with disabilities being reached by risk education. Reporting on casualties is also very limited in state party reporting, despite Article 5 of the Convention requiring state parties with victims to make every effort to collect reliable and relevant data regarding cluster munition victims. So to conclude, the next five years under the Lausanne Action Plan will provide a good opportunity to improve the way that state parties collect casualty data and conduct risk education, ensuring that it is sensitive to gender, age, disability and diversity, and that it reaches the people who most need it. And I'm going to look forward to continue to report on the progress through the Cluster Munition Monitor. Thank you very much. Thanks very much indeed, Ruth. And I, th I think having this sort of uh, having this sort of data is an absolutely essential uh, baseline for this sort of conversation. So thanks very much for everything you and your colleagues at the Monitor do to to, to track this. Um, great. Next, we're going to hear then from uh, Luba Garasimova, um, who's going to talk to us about uh, Action Twenty Eight and particularly uh, um, drawing on her experiences with mass in Afghanistan. Luba, over to you. Thank you very much. Uh, let me just. Share my screen. And thank you everyone for joining. I hope everyone can see my, my screen now. But, <laughs> so I will present to you um, just a few examples of how uh, what the previous presenter mentioned uh, links you to the whole risk education approach that we have currently in uh, Afghanistan. So generally, um, when it comes to risk education in Afghanistan, um, it has been done mainly in schools. Um, according to recent surveys that we've been doing, most people who have uh, received risk education did that in the schools. We've also had quite extensive face-to-face -face sessions in the communities. Um, for Rumas Afghanistan, most recently, we have been focusing not uh, generally on uh, deploying teams to all communities, but really focusing on the most at risk groups, such as returnees from Iran and Pakistan in collaboration with some partners, uh, such as um, IOM and UNHCR. Uh, this is because these people, um, for the most part, have been abroad for quite a while. And while they may be received some risk education in schools when they were young, they are not aware of the most recent context. So we, we partner with um, IOM and UNHCR, their respective uh, transit and attachment centers to provide these activities. We also have risk education as part of um, ordinary survey and clearance operations. And also we have this community-based demining approach where the miners are uh, selected from the local communities. So there is already this link and liaison with uh, the local population who often report devices to these deminers and just uh, they also learn from them and they their awareness um, is improved substantially through just the deployment of these deminers. Uh, we have 
some partners also integrating risk education into activities. For example, UNICEF uh, recently trained their social workers on delivering some just basic risk education. So it's not a full formal session, but still some information to, to the various groups that they're targeting. Over the years, uh, material has remained generally the same uh, with this uh, standard poster that you see on the image leaflets. Um, one specific video that has been used widely for the past maybe over 10 years and it's it's a well-made video it's well-made material but it just hasn't been adapted too much over the years um however as uh, i think we all agree risk education cannot really be a one-size-fits-all approach so this is where this approach of behavior change communication came in uh, what this approach entails is uh, the need to listen to the community to try to understand the different motivations, different behaviors of the target groups uh, for each specific target group. And of course, depending on the context, uh, it's, it's adapted and it really involves a lot of research into the underlying behaviors. Uh, in late 2019, uh, we contracted the company to do some research into the various factors motivating behavior, psychological, social, environmental, that includes, of course, uh, issues like uh, like poverty, as the previous uh, presenter mentioned. Also, the need to uh, to basically have the livelihood and to to uh, do farming or uh, cattle raising in dangerous areas. Um, and the goal of this new approach that we shifted to over the past year, year and a half, is really to to use this research to appeal to people in a more relatable way and. Uh, in a more emotional way. For example, for, for boys, uh, after the analysis of why they behave as they do, um, some, key, some key messages from the research are uh, to focus on explaining to boys that being a hero is not really going into dangerous areas. No, being a hero is really saving your friends from these dangerous areas. So for each target group, we, we also want to reach them in different ways. Uh, for example, not just face-to-face -face session, but also different material, whether it's visual material, audio material um, on the radio, um, and also some other more innovative methods like uh, trying to use mobile communications and just experimenting with different ways and trying to assess how effective these ways are. Um, also, we are trying to have some more uh, positive messaging, um, not to uh, make people, let's say, not do something, not to tell them don't touch, just go away, just don't do anything, but really to empower them to assess the situation um, based on the knowledge that they have and based, to, based on our messaging. And we're trying to explain to them what they should do as opposed to telling them what not to do. That's basically linking also into social psychology, essentially. Now, part of this whole research and this approach is, of course, understanding um, casualty or victim data. And it has been also key part of the initial research in, into shifting to this behavior change communication approach. In Afghanistan, the main source is uh, victim data collection by the Mine Action Program that's led by the National Mine Action Authority and it's recorded into the uh, Mine Action Database. We also have some other complementary sources uh, like security incident data, but this is really used more on an ad hoc basis um, as of now. Um, we're trying to integrate it a bit more into planning, but it's uh, it's not it's not easy to to record and analyze this. But essentially, what this uh, tells us is, in the past month, uh, let's say in a specific district, we we heard about more incidents, about more casualties. So let's look at it because the main victim data collection by partners takes time because it's really in person. So a team has to be deployed to find out more specific information about the incident and record it into the database. So that takes time. Um, we uh, also had a previous victim assistance project uh, in, in Afghanistan. So from that, we already had contacts with uh, people who uh, survived incidents, specifically of uh, victim-operated uh, improvised explosive devices and explosive remnants of war. And we were able to, to survey them to understand actually what happened in, in their situation. And you can see here uh, that only 12% reported that they had knowledge of the risks of explosive ordnance. And of those, only 2% were aware of behaviors that could have prevented the incident. So that uh, it, it's quite worrying, uh, seeing as the mine action problem has been existing for such a long time and as well as risk education. Uh, and also only 16% of the respondents reported that they ever participated in a risk education session. 
Now, you can see the stark difference now. Currently, we are doing some general population surveys, uh, baseline and midline assessments, um, just looking at the different approaches that we are using. And we have questions, um, of course, about whether people receive risk education. And more than half, and sometimes maybe 60 to 70 percent at least, have received risk education. So you can see the stark contrast between the general population and those uh, survivors of incidents. So that tells us that there is something that has to be fixed. And uh, what we are doing with um, the victim data that the National Authority provides is basically we recently integrated it into a dashboard to make it a bit more visual. And I know maybe on people's laptops or computers, it's not very clear because it's a dashboard, but just uh, to give an overall idea, I extracted here just the data for uh, cluster munition victims. And uh, we, we can also have various filters we can see um, specifically for children or adults, uh, what activity uh, was happening at the time of incidents. We can, we can see here also if there are any differences between males and females. And on the right side, we have a, a list of the activity at the time of incidents. You can also see the heat map. We are able to see in which uh, provinces uh, we have the most casualties. Now, from, from this overall, you, you can see that the majority of victims are children in that case, uh, male, and the uh, most common activity during the incident uh, was tending animals. Then the others are uh, playing or recreation, collecting food, water or wood, traveling, or just uh, passing or standing nearby. Uh, and um, the incidents normally lead to injuries rather than deaths. You can see then, if we look at the overall picture, um, uh, this is for post-2001 uh, incidents uh, only. So here we see a different heat map. We see a bit, uh, it's a different distribution of casualties. For example, in this case, um, the majority of casualties are adults, still they're male. Um, but here, we, when we look at the activity, the majority were passing or standing nearby. Then we have traveling as well and a big chunk of unknown, which is uh, something to definitely look at when it comes to the quality of the data. And again, um, it's mostly linked to injuries rather than deaths. And through this dashboard, it's really easy for us to dig into the different uh, provinces, uh, filter also by the type of hazard uh, where the incident took place, filter by age, by, by gender, or by sex, by um, also look at the different activities for different uh, age groups and target the material based on that. What the heat map also very easily shows us is when we have, for example, uh, recently we did some radio broadcasting or some radio messages so we could see in which provinces we may need to do a lot more broadcasting in local radio channels so that we have a wider reach in areas that are not really so accessible. And also to reach um, some groups like nomads who we we have assessed that they can most most easily be reached perhaps by radio as opposed to the normal sessions or some other um, some other methods. We also have some other sources. <clears throat> excuse me. Uh, as I mentioned, we are having some current data collection um, for baseline and midline and endline surveys, and this shows us what the general population uh, experiences. So, for example, we have ask here people if they know someone who was killed or injured, and then if yes, what uh, they were doing when this happened. And you can see some data that generally correlates to the existing um, victim data with some differences. Um, the majority of people are collecting scrap metal, grazing cattle or farming, and uh, collecting also wood, uh, water or food, or just uh, stepping on while walking on the road. Now, when it comes to things like collecting scrap metal, we do see some discrepancy. For example, the way the victim data is collected in the national database, um, there is some information on the very few incidents from uh, scrap metal collection, but there are also some, some things like looking at uh, the, what the person was doing at the time of incident, and very often it's tampering. So it really raises the question of, have we asked the right questions in this data collection? Because on one hand, we are looking of what they were doing exactly, tampering, but the other question is why they were doing it. It's scrap metal collection. So we have to really be careful how to phrase the questions to really understand what's happening behind the, the casualty data. And the way we've adapted um, recently uh, risk education is creating some material based on what we've learned of um, 
specifically in this case for children, you can see that we, we've had some comic books made, uh, just integrating this whole concept that uh, many children are farming while they're being injured or killed. Uh, also, quite a, a lot of them uh, are playing. Uh, we are assuming that it's mostly cricket or some similar games. So we have had some material uh, linking to that. And also we've seen that um, in recent years, the majority of casualties overall are from exp um, improvised explosive devices. And this has not been a featured theme in risk education materials. So we are trying to integrate it more and more. And we recently created an animated video on the bottom right. You, you can see that we tried somehow to display uh, and I didn't link it to the fact that uh, it's, it shouldn't be collected as scrap metal um, and, and so forth. So uh, generally, just to conclude, uh, data is really important when it comes to adapting risk education, and you really have to look at the various data sources, um, as well as uh, not just the victim data, but also the general population data. Uh, we also have to understand limitations. As I mentioned, we have to be careful what questions we ask and how we ask them. Um, in these newer methods uh, that rely on for collection of data over the phone, we have to understand as well that the reach is not the best because not everyone has a phone and whoever has a phone is usually uh, the male member of the household. So these are some limitations, uh, but still we do uh, have some uh, useful insight that we can explore further in, for example, focus group discussions. For example, you can see here on the page, um, we were also asking people of what's an appropriate response um, to a visible suspected explosive ordinance. And quite a lot of them still think that it's very appropriate to move it or bury it in the ground or take it apart to collect uh, scrap metal. So these are things that we are looking at when it comes to what sort of messaging we integrate. And for example, for um, radio drama or some scripts for other material like comic books, what exactly we include in the storyline, what situations. And we've included scrap metal collection quite a lot recently. And you can collect data through surveys, focus group discussions, and you can also integrate into various existing tools, uh, impact assessment, or um, if partners are collecting some data already, for example, you can integrate it into their uh, methods. And also while developing the material, uh, it's also important to keep discussing uh, with the technical working group, if it's available in your country, with other experts, and also to test the material in the field with different target groups. For example, for the child-friendly material, we tested a lot with uh, children from rural areas, from urban areas, in, in private and in public schools, so that we can just get the, the most useful feedback. Uh, so I think my time is up, or even over time, <laughs> sorry for that, but I hope this was helpful. Thank you. Thank you very much, Yuba. Yeah, really, really good example, both of the importance of data and also of the of the need to really ta tailor interventions to the local context if, if, they're, if they're going to have the maximum impact. Um, thank you very much indeed. Um, so next, we're going to hear from uh, Mohammed Jassim. Uh, he's going to uh, talk to us about uh, Action Twenty Seven and how you uh, integrate risk education into uh, in, in, into wider uh, into wider humanitarian development efforts. Uh, so, uh, Mohammed, uh, over to you. Thank you. Uh, hi, everyone. My name is Mohammed Jassim. I work in with Al Ghed uh, as a risk education supervisor since five years. Uh, so I was invited today to speak uh, about uh, the risk uh, mitigation project that Al Ghed and Halo Trust uh, that are delivering as a partners in Mosul Old City. So uh, while there are not many cluster munitions in Old City, the project is relevant. Uh, today as a CCM because it's a good example uh, of action plan, uh, action point, sorry, uh, number 27 of Lausanne action plan. So which suggests the national uh, strategy should promote the integration of a risk education uh, into a wider humanitarian development, human rights, environmental protection, education efforts. So uh, next slide, please. Uh, let's say, let we speak about uh, the Mosul Old City that uh, I live. Uh, Mosul Old City is a three square meter area that was the last uh, stronghold uh, by ISIS in uh, 2017. Uh, during the fighting, uh, the city was completely destroyed uh, and the area was littered with rubble, yokes, or IEDs, and also and ISIS was uh, booby trapped the space uh, where they left the area. So toward the end of 2020, 
uh, Al Ghadi and the Hero Trust uh, organization received a grant from OMAS uh, to deliver risk education uh, project uh, sessions uh, and implement an open ended uh, risk mitigation project aimed to uh, at high risk uh, aim to at high risk group in all city who fit either the reckless or forest group uh, risk profile the reason is to uh, the reason it was uh, open ended it was and must wanted the project to be designed in consultation with the old city uh, residents next slide please in order to figure out uh, what uh, figure out what the specific risk mitigation project needed uh, was needed, we held several stages uh, of data collection. First of one, uh, we conduct uh, key informative interviews with male and female community representatives uh, to give some initial impressions of who was at risk and why, and to identify the potential uh, participant in a focus group discussion. After that, we held two focus group discussions. Uh, one for men and one for women to find out who they thought was most at risk and why as well. And also to brainstorm the potential solutions uh, and see what uh, sort of a project they thought would be most uh, beneficial. Due to COVID uh, restriction, you know, we held the decision online, uh, the discussion, sorry, online, and we uh, we would be happy to talk more later about this data process. So the common theme uh, that uh, came uh, out uh, of the KI and the FG FGD were, first point is the children and adolescents were uh, considered uh, the most at risk group uh, since the children's lack of awareness was thought to put them at as a while adolescent uh, were a combination of a reckless and the forest due to the lack of the alternative option. The second point, recreational space, which is so important, should be created and an alternative that would be allow adolescents to spend their free time uh, in a safer areas. So from the KI and FJD, we were want to adolescent to be our target group. And we thought we might be looking to create a recreational space in all city. But at that, that point, we had not actually talked to the many adolescents, our target group, you know, from the old city to see what, what they uh, thought about, the, about them at risk uh, and kind of a project they would want to do. After that, we focused on discussion with the adolescent and we delivered a variable analysis uh, to 76 uh, youth in, in the area, in the most old city. And the survey was meant to do is a few things. Number one, it gives us some baseline uh, information regarding the safe and unsafe behavior. And also the second point, we, we use it to find out some of the barrier to safe behavior from the adolescent point of view. And finally, we use this the chance to talk uh, them to find out uh, kind of a project they want uh, and why they thought to keep them safer. So. The, the major findings from the survey regarding the risk mitigation part of this project was that overwhelmingly, the adolescents suggest, suggested that the park uh, in the old city would be, would be provide them a safe, they, the space they need to be uh, stay safer. As they uh, currently do not have any alternatives, but spend their free time in a dangerous area. Next slide, please. As you can see here, this is the park site before we rehabilitated. This park is full of rubble. And it's oh, and first of all, we don't know if it's danger or not because we don't uh, know the situation that happened there. So uh, Red and the Hello Trust worked together in partnership with the municipality of Mosul uh, to select the site and to check the site uh, because this site is uh, located in the middle of the old city which is very important for the people living there. And after that, uh, we, we found there is many tunnels inside this park, ISIS tunnels for, the, for this park. After that, we start rehabilitating by selecting a local contractor here from Mosul. Uh, and they, uh, they started uh, rehabilitating the site, as you can see in this photo. Next slide, please. Okay, uh, the park, uh, the park un unofficially opened on 1st of August, 
and the, the official opening is set of this November. So Hello has received additional fund uh, from a private donor to build a playground and uh, uh, swings and a tent for the URE sessions where, where within the park. Once this is finished, we hope that the uh, park will serve to reduce the risk education of both the highest risk group and the community and divide uh, at, that, uh, at the outset. Then uh, the thing uh, I want to emphasize here is the risk education of OCD could not stand alone uh, to mitigate the everything, everyone risk. The community believed that until the area was, was cleared, in order to keep the docent safe and risk education component had to be integrated with an urban development and the rehabilitation of the safe recreational area to be effective. So next slide, please. Okay. Uh, at this point, it is too bit early to tell the, eff the effects of this opening in the park on the adolescent risky behavior. What we do now is that even though even though the park isn't officially open yet, as I said, it is being used. We have a, we have a park use uh, monitoring tool that show up uh, up to 40 uh, people are in the evening. And we know that the last enough adolescent boys are using it uh, to capture the photo of them. We are planning to conduct another barrier analysis uh, survey in November where we will you know, see whether the adolescent report the same barrier to safe behavior and get their uh, perceptions of, the, of whether their risks are reduced due to the park being there. Uh, also in February, we will hold an online workshop with the ERE advisory group to present the findings from the survey, that survey. Next slide, please. Okay, I believe the key taken away uh, from our project are that. First point, we, we, we know lack of information and the awareness are not the only reason people, uh, reason people uh, are at risk from explosive ordinance in post covid communities. The project highlights uh, a few ways that risk education and risk mitigation can and uh, can and need to be integrated with other sector in order to be effective as possible. The second point, uh, this is specific project illustrate the importance of rebuilding community, reaction, uh, reaction, uh, reactional spaces. But what also want to highlight is that it's not necessary about part and urban development. In the end, it is, uh, it is about that process of engaging with the community and finding out what they need. Uh, and finding a way to make that uh, uh, happen. So I think the core of this uh, project was those uh, initial discussion where, where we found out uh, who the community thought was at risk and got their thought on a solutions. Uh, and then uh, we and then we followed uh, that well, that up what uh, with, with engaging uh, with the at risk group and getting their solution and then the ability to implement the project that makes the process a bit special. The last point uh, is I would like to make uh, is uh, ultimately that the only, the only reason this project was able to happen in this way uh, is because a donor recognized that there was a need to go uh, beyond the risk education sessions and the OMAS provided a funding with the uh, flexible for the project to be truly community driven. So I would like to use the opportunity to highlight to donor if it's important for the risk education to be integrated, then those opportunities to integrate it should be built into a available funding. And this risk education mind group would be pushed uh, for those opportunities. Next slide, please. As you can see here, the, the park with the beneficiaries. Uh, and also I want to thank you for allowing me to allowing me the time to share our experience with the integrated risk education project. And I will now pass it to, back to Celine. Thank you. And all you are invited to visit our park in Mosul. Thank you. Thank you so much, Mohammed. A really, a really powerful example of how 
properly integrating uh, risk education into wider activities can can result in something which which is mutually supportive. Um, so risk education can support other other interventions and and, and vice versa. That's uh, that's great. And I wish you all the all the best of luck with your uh, uh, with your with your park. It looks uh, it looks great. Thank you. Um, Thank you. Um, so we're, we're going to move to our last speaker now, um, Celine Cheng, um, and we're going to be staying on Action 27 and looking at uh, um, national strategies and how they can uh, draw on, on best practices and standards um, to, uh, to, to, to really uh, make sure that they, get, they, they, they have the best chance of, of succeeding. So uh, Celine, over to you. Great, thank you. I'm just going to try and share my screen. Can someone confirm once they can see my screen? Not yet. Maybe Caitlin, can you just share my presentation for me, please? Yep, give me just one second. Thanks. Pulling it up now. Thanks so much, Caitlin. There we go. All right. Well, thank you, Ambassador. And so in this last presentation, the Explosive Ordnance Risk Education or EORE Advisory Group would like to continue to focus on action number 27. Next slide. So just a kind reminder that action number 27 of the draft of the action plan focuses on the development of national strategies and work plans that draw on best practices and standards which integrate cluster munitions risk education into other HMA activities, as well as with the wider humanitarian development, human rights, environmental protection, and education efforts. So to highlight the need for cluster munition risk education, we wanted to highlight the icbl -CMC's recently released cluster munitions monitor report for 2021, which we also congratulate them on their successful publication. So in addition to covering the use, stockpile destruction, casualties, contamination, clearance, and victim assistance of cluster munitions, this report also highlights the continued need for cluster munitions risk education. I'm going to emphasize a bit on Ruth's presentation and throw in a few statistics that I feel really highlights the need for cluster munitions risk education. So the first statistic that I'd like to highlight is that between August 2020 and July 2021, Cluster munitions were used in Syria, Armenia, and Azerbaijan. Globally speaking, 360 new cluster munition casualties were recorded in 2020, which is an increase from annual totals in 2018 and 2019. Unfortunately as well, all of these casualties were linked to civilians. Casualties due to cluster munition remnants were recorded in 2020 in Afghanistan, Cambodia, Iraq, Laos, South Sudan, Syria, Yemen, and agorno karabakh Meanwhile, a total of 29 countries and other areas remain contaminated by cluster munition remnants, putting at risk their populations. Azerbaijan had the highest number of casualties resulting from cluster munition attacks, and Syria had the highest number of casualties resulting from cluster munition remnants. So these statistics show that there is and still remains a high need for risk education not just risk education of cluster munition remnants, but also risk education for cluster munition attacks. So this presentation is going to be divided into two parts. And first off, we're going to look at the first half of action number 27, the development of national strategies and work plans drawing on best practices and standards. For this part, I'm going to briefly hand over the floor to my colleague, Masha Nahuel from the GICHD, who's also a core member of the EORE advisory group. And he'll be uh, speaking more about ideas of strategic planning and how it relates to EORE. Following Mathieu, I'll be highlighting some of the available resources and tools that can be used to guide effective and e efficient implementation of the risk education action points highlighted under the draft Lausanne action plan. 
So over to you, Mathieu. Thank you very much, Celine. Uh, good morning. Good afternoon, everyone. Um, thank you for giving me the floor. Um, and what I'll do here is um, sort of take a deeper dive into um, the importance of strategic planning in mine action general, but uh, also more specifically in risk education. So as we all know, the importance of national mine action strategies developed in line with good practice, but also the international mine action standards has long been recognized for their contribution to more efficient and effective mine action programs. And such strategies have been in place in several countries that are affected by cluster munitions for years, such as Lao PDR, for instance. The Lausanne Action Plan explicitly acknowledges the importance of national strategies and strategic planning in its first two action points. And as just mentioned by Celine on her slide, this is further reinforced under Action 27 of Section 6 on Risk Education. And I quote again, where feasible and appropriate, states parties will develop national strategies and work plans drawing on best practice and standards, end of quote. Now, the, the value of strategic planning processes that include risk education as a core component is more than just its end results and the publication of a strategy. Um, strategic planning processes that are inclusive and participatory provide platforms for a broad range of national and international stakeholders to discuss uh, challenges, needs, opportunities, and priorities, and to find solutions. So in that sense, national strategic to do several, um, several things. One is to raise the profile of risk education at national level. It's to develop a robust theory of change and a results framework to integrate the last global good practice, such as, for instance, as mentioned by Ruth in her presentation, ensuring that risk education is grounded in a solid context analysis. And finally, maybe to make sure also that um, risk education is adequate, adequately funded. The GSCHE experience supporting strategic planning efforts since 2012 has shown that these processes generally strengthen collaboration and information sharing among stakeholders but it also promotes mine actions integration into broader sectors, um, such as protection, development, humanitarian, education, uh, sectors and agendas, which are also crucial um, for risk education interventions as highlighted in the second part of Action 27, but also as illustrated just now by Mohammed in his presentation of the, the project in Mosul. So when developing a new or reviewing an existing mine action national strategy, it is key for national mine action authorities and partners to include where relevant risk education in that process from the start. And as we've seen in some countries, doing so has resulted in the creation of a specific strategic goal on risk education in either a newly adopted mine action strategy or a reviewed mine action strategy, which is the case, for instance, uh, in Iraq, uh, where the the new uh, multi-year strategy will, will be adopted very soon and it includes a strategic objective on uh, risk education. But this has also resulted in the creation, for instance, of uh, specific risk education national strategies that reflect the latest development in the sector. And when I mean the latest development in the sector, I refer, for instance, to something that Yubia also mentioned, which is um, the integration of behavior change uh, approaches in the risk education sector amongst other things. Another fundamental element of strategic planning processes um, and of risk education interventions uh, as a whole is the need to develop and adopt a result-based framework. Um, so having a theory of change either at organization-wide or country program level is key. Um, the evaluability of any strategic plan or any EORI intervention depends on whether it is based on a results framework, such as a theory of change. And more specifically for risk education interventions, um, without having an idea of how behavior change is assumed to come about, uh, it will be difficult to assess whether the activities and the outputs uh, were effectively uh, were successful in leading to the intended outcomes. So having a solid theory of change has also proven instrumental in facilitating buy-in 
and engagement from high-level ministries in countries, but also from donors. Um, and finally, we've noticed that it also enables a program to plan midterm reviews, to take stock of achievements and challenges, and most importantly, to adapt and learn along the way. So in this regard, I'd like to mention a couple of resources that Celine will probably highlight also after. Um, UNICEF, with the support of um, the Swiss government and the GACHD, organizes um, annual face-to-face -face courses in Spitz, Switzerland. One is on developing effective EURE, uh, specifically targeted at EURE practitioners. And another one uh, focuses on integrated mine action for the broader sector where colleagues and partners are encouraged to incorporate risk education into any mine action theory of change. So both courses will uh, resume in 2022. And so far we have about 80 EORE uh, specialists from 30 countries that have been trained through these courses. So if you want more information, um, we will share Hugues Laurent's email in the chat. Um, and then finally, I wanted to mention another um, important resource. Uh, we recently published a working paper on measuring the results of EORE. It has been shared uh, widely and also through the uh, IMRE working group. And we will paste the link to this um, publication in the chat. So to conclude, um, allow me to command states parties for having elevated the profile of risk education in the draft uh, action plan through section six. Um, based on our own experience at the GSEG in supporting planning processes, um, my main, our main takeaway would be that national strategic planning processes with solid result frameworks offer significant opportunities to strengthen risk education responses, but also to concretely implement um, the lab action plan and it's uh, different actions that will be adopted later today. Thank you very much. Over to you, Celine. Thank you, Mathieu, for that. So now let's turn to some of the available resources and tools that uh, we have to access best practices and standards. And one of the most important resources out there, which I'm sure everyone here is familiar with already, is IMAS 12.10 on EORE. So this IMAS underwent a significant revision last year, and it's been one of the most substantial updates to this IMAS since 2009. I've highlighted a few of the principal changes here, and one of the most evident changes in this IMAS has been the transition from the use of mine risk education, or MRE, to explosive ordnance risk education, or what we just refer to as EORE or EO. This is a really welcome change, as it better reflects the scope of work of risk education and what we do. And as a kind reminder, explosive ordnance in the context of IMAS refers to mines, cluster munitions, unexploded ordnance, abandoned ordnance, booby traps, other devices as defined under the Convention of Conventional Weapons Amended Protocol Number 2, and certain improvised explosive devices. Another highlight in this IMAS has, is the addition of a new section on explosive ordnance injury surveillance system. And we saw this already put into practice in Luba's presentation um, on uh, social and behavior change communications. So to explain what is exactly meant by explosive ordnance injury surveillance system, I wanted to quote directly from IMAS 12.10. Here it states that explosive ordnance injury surveillance refers to the ongoing and systematic co collection, analysis, interpretation, and dissemination of explosive ordnance incidents related data, essential for effective planning, implementation, monitoring, and evaluation of explosive ordnance risk reduction activities, including EORI. They provide an essential source of evidence to systematically document the most at-risk groups, the most at-risk areas, and the most at-risk behavior to support the targeting, tailoring, and prioritization of EORE interventions. With the addition of this section in IMAS 12.10, we're hoping that it will encourage EORE actors, including national mine action authorities, to establish or strengthen existing injury surveillance systems and to systematically collect and analyze this data to prioritize and provide evidence-based EORE that is adapted to all at risk. I think our previous presenters have also highlighted in their respective presentations the importance of using uh, sex and age disaggregated data for their own implementations. In this latest version of IMS 12.10, we're also welcoming the use of stronger and more prescriptive language on gender 
conflict sensitivity and a humanitarian principle that will encourage our sector to continue providing inclusive and ethical explorative ordinance risk education. We're also welcoming the increased emphasis on data collection, analysis, and prioritization, and updated requirements for systematic EORE field testing. Most notably, the requirement for field testing has now moved from should to shall test all messages and suggested means of delivery, making field testing a mandatory component of, EO, of the EORE project cycle. The IMS is also updated to reflect new context that has arisen and challenged the EORE sector over recent years. Most significantly, the increased use of improvised explosive devices and conflicts, which complements the draft technical note on IED risk education, which was added to IMS 12.10 in June 2018. Finally, although not new to, I, to this IMS 12.10, we wanted to take this opportunity to remind the sector of the role EORE can play in building political will in favor of mine action and advocating for adherence to important conventions, including the Convention on Cluster Munitions. The standard is currently available in English, Russian, and Arabic. So in addition to this IMAS, which is an international standard that our community and national authorities should be following, there are other resources from both the EORA AG and other organizations that we hope will support the sector in developing more efficient and effective risk education for cluster munitions in full compliance with IMAS 12.10. And one of the first uh, resources that we wanted to highlight was the International Mine Risk Education Working Group. The name is going to be changed eventually to uh, International Explosive Ordnance Risk Education Working Group. But this is an active network of over 400 EORA practitioners and supporters. It's an excellent forum to allow members to share EORA or simply just to pose EORA related questions or initiate a discussion around EORA. Anyone can register and participate in this group. The registration link is on the PowerPoint and it's also going to be included in the group chat for everyone. And to register, you just need to go onto this site and then you can click join. Moving on to the next resource, the EORA advisory group currently stores research, guidance and tools that is accessible publicly and can be downloaded directly from the site. So as you can see, this is our website. And if you can just scroll down all the way, there we go to the resources. So some of the resources that we currently have, they include an advocacy strategy with key messages on EORE, guidance on the standardizing EORE beneficiaries definitions, papers on assessing, monitoring, and evaluation EORE, and evaluating EORE, including the use of a barrier analysis and the working paper on the results of EORE that Matthew had just mentioned. There's also some resources for using the displacement tracking matrix for mine action as well, and a paper on new technologies and methodologies for EORE in challenging content. So these are some examples of the resources that we have. And again, anyone can access our website. I believe it'll be put up on the chat if not already, and you can download for free all of these resources that we have. In addition to our website, there is a summary of past EORA AG events with recordings where relevant, and this can be accessed on our YouTube page, the link of which I believe will also be added to the chat. So in addition to this, the advisory group website hosts a calendar of events relevant for all EORA practitioners, and this calendar of events is regularly updated. One of the new um, tools that we have is an EORA hour that the EORA AG plans to organize on a frequent basis. The first EORE hour that we're going to have is next week, and it'll be on the topic of regional harmonization of data collection, analysis, and messages in Western and Central Africa. We hope that you'll be able to join us. Also, we'd like to introduce you various resource libraries on EORE that we have. So um, since the outbreak of COVID-19, the advisory group has gathered resources to provide best practice guidance on sharing EORE messages during the pandemic. You'll see the link on the slide as well as it'll be added onto the chat. Um, whilst these resources are catered and were collected during the COVID pandemic, we'd also like to highlight that it can be used uh, for other kinds of contexts. For example, if you need to reach a remote area, for example, so a lot of these resources 
border link to COVID can be used uh, for other contexts as well. In addition, the GICHD hosts a resource library on EORE best practices more generally, so it extends beyond uh, COVID. And these include resources, research, and tools from both mine action and other sectors. Finally, another resource library to highlight and which Matthew has also highlighted is the UNICEF resource library on effective uh, EORE and their course that they hold in speeds. So this library is particularly useful. Um, as Matthew mentioned, the course has been put on hold due to COVID, but the resource library contains all of the presentations that would normally be delivered during the course. And so just as some examples, presentations include uh, the use of injury surveillance systems, linking EORE with the sustainable development goals, and how to practically deliver results-based EORE. So it's a very nice tool uh, to take into consideration in the absence of being able to attend the course uh, in person. We understand that having multiple resource libraries can be a bit confusing, and so plans are underway to merge all of these various libraries into one comprehensive library, into one, sorry, comprehensive library. Finally, but certainly not least, the advisory group is really excited to introduce the EORE Essentials e-learning course, which was developed by the GICHD with support from over 20 different partners. So this online course introduces the subject of explosive ordnance risk education, and it targets, targets specifically those new and interested in the EORE sector. The course has been designed to provide in under two hours an overview of what is EORE, its core principles, and its linkage with other mine action pillars and sectors. And the course can be accessed on all kinds of devices and has also been designed to be accessible for those with visual impairments. Translations of this EORE Essentials e-learning course is also being planned and prepared. On top of this, uh, there will in the future be four further modules that will be developed and this um, e-learning will target specifically EORE practitioners. So it'll be an e-learning that's a bit more detailed, more comprehensive, and it'll focus specifically on how to implement quality and ethical EORE. So the development and compilation of these aforementioned resources wouldn't have been possible without the support of numerous actors. And we thank all of them for their support and contributions over the years. While we believe that great strides have already been taken um, to professionalize the EORE sector and to uphold our obligations to, interventional, to international conventions, such as the Convention of Cluster Munitions, we also acknowledge that a lot more does need to be done. And in particular, the EORE AG, we see an increasing need to influence research and provide more specific guidance on risk education in contexts where conflict may be ongoing with aerial bombing shelling attacks, including cluster munition attacks. We know that this is an area that requires more expl exploration of the sector to better understand how risk education can support in these situ situations. And it's a subject that the EORE AG are hoping to explore deeper in the future. Through our work, we hope to continue to support all actors to uphold their commitments under the design action plan and deliver quality EORE, thus reducing the risk of EORE, uh, thus reducing the risk of EO, including cluster munitions worldwide. Thank you. Thanks very much indeed, uh, Celine, and uh, and to Matthew as well for that. Uh, and, and, and it's really good to have a a collection of, of, uh, of signposts to, uh, to the various resources that are available as well, um, which I'm sure, uh, I'm sure people will find really useful. Right, we've got uh, about 10 minutes uh, for, uh, for a quick um, question and answer session. Um, so as I said earlier, if people do want to ask a question, uh, either put it in the chat or, uh, or, or, or raise your hand. Um, we, uh, and, and as I said earlier, um, Please, please do also get in touch uh, if, if there's any questions you'd, you'd like to you'd, you'd like to sort of take offline or, uh, uh, or or things to follow up uh, follow up later as well. Um, I, I just had a quick uh, a quick question um, which sort of picks up particularly on, on what uh, Luba and Mohammed were saying. But um, uh, obviously, you know, the pandemic has has um, changed the way we all uh, we all work over the last eighteen months. Um, Obviously, I, I guess a lot of the uh, the, the sort of um, EORE interventions have had to uh, 
have had to adapt to the pandemic and to be done in a safe way. But I was I was equally struck by um, by what Uber was saying about um, about the dangers of relying perhaps too much on on, on sort of collecting data or delivering messages by uh, by phone or online, given uh, given sort of how widely available those tools are and and, and who controls them ultimately. Um, so I, I wonder if, uh, well, particularly Uber and, and, and Mohammed, or, or if anybody else wanted to just sort of say a little bit about how uh, how the pandemic has affected EORE on the ground and what what sort of new opportunities might have opened up that that we haven't explored before, and uh, and, and and what uh, what we need to what we need to catch up on once uh, once the situation allows. I could maybe start. Um, thanks very much. Sure. It's a, yeah, it's a very good question. <laughs> um, I would say yes. What the pandemic led to um, essentially is relying much more on uh, remote messaging. Uh, we did have to reduce the uh, uh, sizes of the sessions. For example, there are multiple guidelines based on how many victims there were in Afghanistan uh, from COVID. So I think right now we're back up to I think 15 people per session as far as I can recall. So this was definitely affected in just how many people can be reached by just an ordinary session. Um, the other thing that is linked to the pandemic is also related to neighboring Iran, for example, where because of the situation there, people started returning more to Afghanistan. So we had this influx of returnees. And um, when I would go to like the, some border areas just to see how a session looks like, it was really overwhelming to those providing the session because it was so many people like coming in so many like in huge waves so that definitely was a challenge and in the meantime also we actually did much more remote messaging through radio for example and we now started a project to experiment uh, like a mobile messaging basically uh, with one of the mobile operators people can dial into this free number and get some information of course then links to the limitation of who has the phone but that's uh, definitely um, one thing that happened. And also now we have started partnering more with um, education and emergencies working group in country to integrate risk education more into their activities because these are like longer standing activities and they are in the community, they're providing education. So integrating risk education with that uh, would be very useful actually. And it has already started. Now, obviously with the Taliban taking over, the situation has changed even further. Um, and I think now, for now, for these months, we may have to rely even more on remote messaging due to the fact that risk education teams are mixed, male and females, but they're not always related. So they are currently, there's no written approval for them to deploy back to provide risk education face to face. So that's also an, an added challenge now. Mm. Yeah, absolutely. Well, it's, it's very much on our minds, um, uh, and particularly when, when the uh, uh, extension request was being presented yesterday by the uh, by the Afghan mission here. So uh, yeah, you're very much in our in our thoughts. Um, Zareen Khan Maya, you've uh, you've got your hand up. Would you like to ask, uh, ask a question? Uh, thank you very much. Uh, good morning and good afternoon, ambassador and all uh, uh, panel uh, members and also colleagues who presented the presenter. Uh, just uh, and also thanks for the luba from our colleagues from Afghanistan. I'm Zanin Khan Mayer from uh, HI Afghanistan program as a AVR technical advisor. Thanks for this opportunity uh, to share some experience on about uh, COVID-19 pandemic. As my colleague uh, added about uh, remote messaging, uh, as a lesson learned, we also adopted reaching to most uh, vulnerable communities. We also used as a CHI uh, vocal campaign uh, using loudspeaker and also uh, some audio messages through this vehicle in different location. Uh, and also we established some uh, uh, banners and billboards in some very strategic location, uh, making the people a uh, little bit more, uh, making the accessible the messages to them. Currently, as the colleagues mentioned, Luba, that there still exists this measure and the sector uh, was able to develop a guideline and to establish and show widely which is still in place and we are maximizing uh, 15 people in each session. And we're also considering the, uh, their safety, providing the mosque uh, to all the participants, making them sure that they are uh, safer from this pandemic because the situation is still not uh, very clear to decide on how. 
So this was about uh, pandemic of COVID-19. And also I would like to uh, share a few points uh, about uh, uh, progressive risk education and taller risk education is we know that uh, the problem it is always in the community and our focus is to be in the community. Uh, so as said that uh, the community problem can be solved through the community resources. My point is, Integration of risk education at the community level. There is different uh, uh, cross root level uh, at cross root level. There is different uh, forum, different network. Uh, we have to integrate with them and maintain these messages. As a lesson learned during this COVID-19, it will be a good uh, approach and good focal points in the community uh, just to communicate with them and they uh, spread these uh, safety messages about the exclusive ordinance and so on. And we. As a working with a sector, very old sector since many years, uh, then we also witnessed some good practices. Uh, we can say that the integration process is still quite highly considered. In the past, we integrated risk education key messages in the school curriculums. And also we approached it to the religious affairs, which was a very good uh, approach. But unfortunately, uh, as a lesson learned being designing as a project and then stop and no follow up order, uh, this will be lost somehow. So the sector uh, based on the five year strategic uh, national mine action strategy, this integration process is still considered and that will be followed. Uh, and this is a good practice and as a lesson learned, it can be the only solution uh, reaching to the gross root level. And about the toilet messages, uh, my colleague from, uh, uh, Afghanistan, she also provided very good update about the approaches which we are using. There was uh, uh, video clips, there was uh, radio clips, uh, so it was a very good. And uh, also we are very keen to look through as a progressively uh, to reaching to the most vulnerable people, uh, to making moral Tyler the community engagement it can be the key indicators to meet them and make sure that which approach, which channel can be most effective, most accessible to them uh, to reach them to prevent this uh, casualty. About behavior changes, my colleague mentioned about uh, assessment and uh, new things. I would like to add uh, that uh, the sector it is very keen. Uh, before each session, uh, there is a quite uh, very well questionnaire uh, designed uh, to ask about the knowledge and their practices. Just after the session, uh, we conduct uh, uh, post questionnaire peeling and to see how this was effective, to make sure that our approaches, our materials, it was effective to them uh, and they are uh, uh, able to understand and there is uh, remarkable changes are made. Rather than waiting month in month for the CAP survey and some other assessment, uh, it is aimed just to uh, collect the key information and adopt our activities as well. Uh, the data, it is a very good indicator and very good tool to identify the behavior and their practices. Unfortunately, my colleague mentioned that the data is collected only by the mine action operators, uh, which we can say it is very limited data and it will be very late sometime to reach uh, for the Tyler risk education. Uh, I would like to also confirm that the sector, uh, the mine action sector, based on the national strategic plan, we are also very keen and we are working with the different uh, sectors uh, to integrate this data collection with other networks, uh, mostly those which are based in their community. Even it can be the health facility, it, even it can be the community focal pine, whatever, but it needs to be created and will be further uh, followed. Thank you very much. Over from this. Thanks very much indeed, Zareen. Um, some, some really important points and, uh, and, and, and great to hear your, your perspectives. Um, Sebastian Kassak from MAG, um, over to you. Okay, good morning, everyone. Glad this uh, advisory group side meeting is on and nice to see you, Ambassador, again. Um, I just wanted to, to add, um, we are planning a, uh, the, the ERE one hour on digital risk education. So, so Mag uh, wants to share experience in four or five countries we have been gathering over the last um, year, more or less. And, and that's uh, coming up as well. 
And of course, it's linked to COVID, but not only. I mean, it, it makes sense um, to, to use the social media and, and new ways of, of uh, communicating. And not so new. I mean, it's also more radio, more use the existing also traditional mass media. And uh, secondly, I just wanted to reply to one thing I saw with, when I um, was watching Yuba's presentation. I, I found them all really fascinating and good to have a deep dive, not just scratch on the surface. Um, I saw the, the point on scrap metal, and I now always say scrap metal is not bad, scrap metal is not dangerous, uh, don't stop people from collecting scrap metal, recycling is good, we, we all want an environmental mind in people and so on, so um, let's be careful what we uh, write sometimes, it's about war scrap, you know? and that's, uh, of course we know this and we're talking about risk education and so on, but it just um, came to my mind. And I think we can learn a lot from Cambodia and Laos, where we had really successful campaigns to stop the scrap metal trade. And so just, um, Yuba, maybe we can link up and link you to people who have really been successful in, in these countries. Thank you. And uh, I really enjoyed this meeting. Thank you. Great. Thank you very much. Yeah, an imp important point. There's, there's, there's always, always sort of... Uh... Other dependencies you've got to take into account with these uh, with these sorts of interventions. That's why it's important to uh, to, to think as broadly as possible. Um, right, I, th I think we're going to sort of wrap it up here. Um, I'll, I'll just go back to the panelists briefly in case they'd like to uh, to respond. I know uh, Mohammed has got his uh, his hand up, so I'll turn to him uh, him first, Mohammed. Okay, thank you again. Uh, I want to speak about our experience about the, about during COVID uh, pandemic. I, as you know, uh, our project in Mosul started at August of 2020. Uh, the problem, uh, we have many restriction uh, because we follow the instruction from OMAS and instruction from the Directorate of Mine Action in Iraq, in Baghdad. So sometimes these instruction not much, which is very, which is very, it's a challenge for us. Uh, so we uh, even uh, we are working in the old city, and the old city of Mosul, the, the, the streets is very narrow. Even we cannot use the vehicles, and uh, for if you're using the loudspeaker, so we cannot use the vehicles because the streets very narrow. And so we change the method and use a small loudspeaker so that the, the uh, staff you, you can travel with this loudspeaker uh, to provide uh, risk education. Also in that period, we use uh, Facebook, many Facebook campaigns uh, targeting children, adolescent and adult. And uh, Onmas provided us with very, very beautiful videos that uh, included the, the key messages for risk education. And after each video, there is many questions. So when the person uh, see this video, he can answer some uh, uh, some questions regarding the risk education. After that, in 2021, the situation become better and we can use a direct session using uh, our flip chart and the OMAS provided us a mask for every beneficiary. And uh, we make a social distance and the, the process become very well. That's what I want to add, thank you. Great, thank you very much. It's really, really interesting to hear how you've, uh, how you've adapted. Thank you. Right, um, I, I I need to sort of wrap up and get down to the palais. I don't know if anybody uh, anybody else had some some final points they wanted to make. Um, wave at me furiously if you do. Um, uh, Zareen, uh, Zareen, did you have another point you wanted to make? No. Okay. I think what we'll do then is we'll, we'll, we'll wrap it up there, so I can uh, I can I can get down to the uh, to the palais, and everybody else can make a quick cup of coffee before they log into the uh, in, into the sessions to follow uh, to follow day two of the review conference. Um, thank you all ever so much for your uh, for your contributions today. It's been a really useful discussion, uh, at least for me. Um, thank you very much to our panelists and and to all of you who've uh, who, who've joined us this morning. Um, as I said, th this this event is being recorded, has been recorded, so um, so you'll be able to. Uh, uh, to, to, to look at it later on. I think I think that'll be shared with all participants so you can go back and review what was said. Um, so thank you all very much indeed once again um, and um, have a good have a good day. Thank you to you all. Have a nice thank day. You. Thank, thank you very much. Bye-bye. Thank you. Bye-bye. Thanks everyone. Bye.